Welcome to Tech Talk Quiz, Rishi. How are you, Dave? I'm doing very well. Thank you for asking. Cool. Can you introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, my name is David Pine. I'm a technical evangelist, and I live in the United States in uh, Wisconsin. I'm a Microsoft MVP and Google developer expert, and I've kind of been building my career around um, helping out the developer community. Great. You are also two-time MVP, and you also got an Google Developer Expert Award, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so how did you got that Google Developer Expert Award? So the Google Developer Expert Award is, is it's very similar to the Microsoft MVP Award in that, you know, Google is celebrating and recognizing developers who kind of go out of their way to, to help out the developer community. So for me specifically, I've been having this emphasis on, you know, developer technologies and web technologies and things of that nature. So there's kind of a, a rigorous process behind the evaluation of potential Google developer experts with me specifically. Well, and anyone actually that becomes a Google developer expert, you have to be kind of nominated by your peers. So an existing Google developer expert has to nominate you. And then there's several interviews. So I, I had to interview with individuals from the Google you know, product lines and then current standing Google developer experts and several of those. And basically they, they evaluate you throughout the course of that interview process and, and give you a thumbs up or thumbs down. Cool. Are you part of a Google community? Um, so that's the thing. I'm not really, I wouldn't say that I'm a, a huge part of the, the Google community. I'm a huge advocate for uh, web technologies, like holistically. So for me, it's been, um, you know, Angular, obviously. That's, you know, if there's if there's ever to be a battle about spa frameworks, um, I, I would definitely be on the, the side of Angular opposed to React. And I'm, I'm a huge proponent of TypeScript, and I love that there's been this, you know, collaboration between these huge companies, right? These huge organi uh, organizations with, you know, Microsoft and Google, and I love how, um, you know, Google is, is pretty much imposing that if you're to use Angular, uh, you should be using TypeScript along with it, which, as everyone should know by now, TypeScript is a language I love. I love that. JavaScript has matured and now we have types and I love that um, you know it's, it's a product of uh, Anders from from Microsoft and so Google's imposing that Angular has TypeScript and it's a Microsoft thing and you know with Visual Studio Code the kind of the give and the take is that Visual Studio Code is built on top of Chromium which is um, from Google right that's what runs you know that's what uh, Chrome Google Chrome sits on top of so it's it's really neat to see these two huge organizations kind of collaborating and working together to make web experiences better for every developer. I agree. And I can see that Google and Microsoft are collaborating together for Angular because it is, of course, open source and their, their developers are contributing to Angular and TypeScript, of course, was developed by the same person who developed C Sharp. So there's a lot of similarities in TypeScript and C Sharp. So this is really good also for Microsoft developers. Now, Absolutely. another question I had for for you was, what is the pathway to becoming a solution architect? Because I see you are one. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the the pathway is is really just you know, any any anything to really you know further your career. Um, you know, I started as a software engineer, uh, and just as my career has progressed, I've become more and more drawn to, uh, you know, helping teams embrace best practices and, you know, kind of helping impose that. 
so it's it's been this natural progression through my career and for me you know i look at the solution uh, solutions architect role as being an opportunity to really um embrace what i i hold true to my heart is, you know best practices and uh the best you know patterns and and making sense of um you know code and and helping teams kind of architect the best solution possible while understanding you know production deadlines and stuff like that so with me specifically i'm working with you know about 20 different teams right now um and kind of jumping from team to team and helping them design and uh you know that path, you know, the path forward through, um, you know, those designs and, and kind of exemplify what that looks like. Great. So before you were a solution architect, I guess you were also a software team leader. And then you uh, so slowly uh, migrated to a higher role. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, If if we take a step back and look at my career, um, I, I was a, a full-time employee um, for several various you know uh, companies, and then I I discovered consulting. So I've been doing consulting now, and on LinkedIn specifically, I'll kind of highlight all the engagements that I'm doing throughout my consulting career. Um, so so yeah, I was um, the the UI team lead for. Um, a massive project for an enterprise 500 company and um, kind of helped develop a, a huge um, solution, yeah, a series of solutions really and, and integrating with um, some really, really smart people. And um, then I had another engagement where I was able to uh, get into this, you know, higher level program level uh, solutions architect role. So, Again, helping multiple teams rather than just focusing on like a single team. Great. So, in my mind, a solution architect is someone who is responsible for the overall architecture and design of the application. For example, that person may be drawing UML diagrams, ERD diagrams, and collaborating with the team to make sure that everything is made to the design and to the architecture. So this is what I think, but what is exactly what you do as a solution architect? Yeah, it, it's definitely all those things that you highlighted. So your, your, um, your imagination is spot on. Um, for me, it's, it, it can be more granular though, or it can be even higher level. So there's, there's, there's two aspects to it. Um, you know, I, I can, influence teams um, with which type of tooling and which type of um, direction to take. You know, I can help them assess and they can lean on me for that type of advice, right? So, for example, uh, one one common scenario is, is migrating from ASP.NET Framework to ASP.NET Core. Is it worth it? Um, what are the implications? What are the pros and cons? What are the challenges that they're going to face? Um, what type of tools could they use to assess, you know, portability, right? With like the .NET portability uh, analyzer and things like that. Like how, so they they can lean on me for those types of, um, you know, almost decision making, you know, helping them influence what what the right path for it is based on what they've been doing and what their team looks like. You know, I've been a developer for many, many years. So I've experienced these things firsthand. And I've been, um, you know, for example, with ASP.NET Core specifically, I've been following that since it was an alpha. Same thing with Angular. So it's, it's you know, I've, I've lived through most of these pains and I've, I can speak to them. And I think that's one of the responsibilities um, in this role is to really help, um, you know, put my bias aside, right? As, As developers, we're innately drawn to the latest and greatest technologies. Um, but I have a chip on my shoulder because I've been a developer for so long. So I'm not just going to say the latest and greatest technologies is the path forward because um, I emphasize with those those types of issues. And it's at the end of the day, you know, there's always a production um, deadline, uh, release date, right? So it's 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 always good to try to you know try to assess 
um, and, and identify really the best tool for the job. So that's the one aspect, right, getting granular. And then the higher level stuff is looking back at, you know, taking a step back and looking at the whole program, right? You know, if we've got 20 teams, what are all those 20 teams doing? What what are they responsible for? But more importantly, how can they interact together? And what core components do um, do each of those things, you know, rely on? And how do those entities um, correlate? And, uh, you know, is, is, you know, one team more productive than the other? How self-sufficient are they? How are they organized? Are we using, you know, like some scaled agile framework for um, each team? Are they independently scrum teams, right? There's all these things that come into play and it's, it's hard. There's a lot of decision making. There's a lot of um, influencing. There's a lot of emphasis on trying to do the best thing and, you know, collaboration and communication is key. Great. I agree with you. Of course, we have to collaborate and communication helps a lot with that. Now, I had another question for you. We were talking about the Microsoft MVP award. So what mm -hmm. and what does this award mean? Because I see that a lot of people on LinkedIn has this award for different platforms. Some have it for Azure, some have it for uh, .NET especially. So what does it mean exactly? Yeah, so uh, very similar to the Google Developer Expert Program, the Microsoft MVP uh, was updated recently so that you have to be nominated by current standing MVPs or Microsoft employees, I believe. Um, and then there's um, basically for the MVP program, you have to uh, you have to be a community contributor and you have to kind of log all your activities. And again, it's very similar to what you have to do in the Google Developer Expert Program. Um, so it's an annual basis where uh, the Microsoft uh, MVP program and corresponding product groups will sit down and evaluate all of the nominations and all of the MVPs and look at all the, the impacts that they're having in their communities. So it's not necessarily just like a number game, right? There, there's not there's not this, uh, you need to have given three talks and if you wrote five blog posts, you'll be considered. What it really is, is what impact are you having on the community that you're trying to serve? So for me, the developer community is all about, uh, it's all about giving back. I've been consuming so much from the developer community over the years that I'm I'm immensely gratified by this, you know, feeling of being able to give back and help others. And there's different ways of kind of measuring that uh, that impact. And, um, you know, both the MVP program and the GTE program look at um, like the numbers of views that you'll have or or how many people read a blog post or. Um, how many people are contributing on an open source um, project or how many talks have you given, but not just how many talks have you given, but where have you given them at and how many people attended those talks and what are, what's the feedback from those talks that you've given? Um, you know, all these things kind of build up to uh, an activity stream. So if you were to look at my um, Microsoft MVP profile, you'll see just a, a constant stream of activity. And it's all these things that we're, uh, any MVP around the globe or Google developer expert for that, for that matter, are, are actively doing, right? They're, they're engaging in the community. They're trying to give back to it. They're trying to strengthen um, technologists and empower them all around the globe. So it's, it's a huge um, enjoyment to be a part of these communities. And as an MVP, there's various designations for that. Like, as you had mentioned, there's Azure and there's um, developer technologies and there's, you know, even stuff for Excel and Word and PowerPoint and uh, Office and all these things, right? So uh, these different, the, the categories are really there to kind of um, just further identify the contributions that you're making. Like, what area are you making these contributions towards? And for developer technologies, that's that's where I land, right? Because I'm I'm a huge proponent of, like I just talked about, you know, Angular, and TypeScript, and 
I'm big on Blazor and WebAssembly, uh, SignalR, .NET Core, ASP.NET Core. I love C Sharp, the language. I've been evangelizing around that for a very long time. So all these different things, I build out, you know, blog posts. I build out tutorials. I build out, um, you know, example projects and talks. And I go and present around the globe on all these things. And I share with the world. Uh, my passions for these technologies and how I consume them and and hopefully help others along the way. That's great. I also agree with you that developers are already contributing back to the community. One example that I like is Stack Overflow. Without it, development would be much harder. Of course, there are blogs also that, that you wrote and other people in the community wrote and these blocks are great to get accounted with the technologies and the talks, of course, bring the community together. Another question I had for you was related to a skill that we saw on your profile. It is quality assurance. So quality assurance, the idea for me that I, when I think of quality assurance in coding, I immediately thought of code reviews. So is that something that you do or you have done in the past to ensure quality? Absolutely, yeah. So for me, quality assurance isn't just, you know, having a, uh, a QA person on your development team. It's quality assurance starts and ends with um, an individual, but then also extends to the entire team, right? There's quality assurance is, is everyone's responsibility and there's um, seemingly endless ways to to uh, quantify that. So uh, code reviews, as you mentioned, is, is a great thing. Um, I'm very collaborative in code reviews um, and I'm very honest too. So code reviews can be a scary thing. As a developer who's you know putting code up there, imagine a situation where there's a gated check-in. So we have a team working on a project and a developer builds out a feature and they they go to have a pull request, you know, uh, following like a, a common GitHub workflow scenario. Um, whoever is at the top of that is going to be responsible for, or, or even a team is going to be responsible for reviewing and providing feedback. But as a developer, that can be scary, right? That's you spend time um, imagining how something should work and you you put forth your best effort, hopefully, and you put yourself out there, right? As a developer, you're you're saying, here is what I think this code should be like. And the problem with programming, uh, good or bad or indifferent, is that there's a million different ways to achieve something. And uh, the other problem is that all developers are opinionated, right? Or most of them are. So uh, soliciting feedback can be challenging. It can be scary. Um, but it's it's the path forward. It's the way to grow. It's the way to uh, collaborate. It's the way to learn from others, and it's a way to uh, kind of help educate yourself and and learn. You know, maybe this wasn't the best approach, but um, you know, what could I have done differently? And I like to rather than you know poke fun at somebody or belittle them or uh, say their code is complete rubbish. <laughs> You know, it's it's easy to do those things, but it's um, at the same time, it's you have to be empathetic. You have to be um, caring and nurturing and collaborative, and you have to be supportive of their putting themselves out there. How can we make this code the best possible whilst you know respecting deadlines? And how can we work together to make this uh, better? And sometimes it's not just code reviews. Maybe it's time to engage with some pair programming, sit down and collaborate together. Maybe. You'll learn something from how someone else does it, or they can learn from you. And it comes back to this notion of, um, you know, no single developer is going to be awesome, but collaboratively, uh, we can be uh, amazing. That's great. I also like to do that in in my company. I would go to uh, my team members sometime and see what their method is to process some tasks, for example, to 
create an API, what, te what technologies are they using and how uh, we can try to improve everything. So this is something I try to look also. And now another question I had, I don't know if you, you are familiar with a new SQL, but I think that this is something that is coming and it is it might be the future, but what is your opinion on that? There's no SQL and SQL. What do you think the future of databases is? Yeah, yeah. So we're, I mean, basically we're discussing uh, various options for um, data stores. And, you know, when we think about SQL versus a NoSQL option, uh, for example, like what was formerly known as Document DB, like, you know, Cosmos DB and um, these, these, you know, document data stores, you know, no SQL, right? They're typically JSON blobs. And um, so if we're to compare those, to me, it's just another tool in the toolbox. And again, stepping back and saying, well, um, you know, what's the future? I don't know if there's, I, I would argue that there's never going to be a situation where we completely get rid of SQL um, and, you know, relational data structures. Um, at the end of the day, I think that NoSQL um, and, and document data stores are uh, amazing to have. There's some huge innovations around how efficient they can be. Um, and it's amazing to have this kind of schemaless um, flexibility, right? And um, that, that's really, you know, terse and performant and um, amazing. Uh, but I don't think, you know, SQL, you know, relational databases are going anywhere. Again, it's just, you know, uh, another tool in the toolbox. And as a developer, it's our responsibility to determine what the best tool is for the job. I think that it is also because almost every major technology is built on top of SQL. And at the same time, no SQL doesn't have that much support yet. It is still new in, in some way. So I think in that sense, we, we, we will still have both technologies for a very long time. Now, I saw on your LinkedIn, and this is also a question which I got from the community before, given that uh, there's a lot of options for taking certification on the market. You, for example, have taken the MS, MCSA, which is a... Microsoft uh, Developer Certificate, I believe. So what is the purpose of taking certification courses? For me, I see it as a kind of side hustle, but what is your, what is your opinion on that? Well, for that, those types of certifications specifically, they're really, really powerful, like earlier in your career. It's a way of kind of vetting yourself and seeing at what level you stand and earning those certifications um, within an organization can be powerful um, in that <clears throat> in that they can um, allow your employer to qualify for uh, becoming like a, a Microsoft partner, for example. So there's these there's these options for taking certain certifications that will enable you to um, you know leverage certain partnership uh, aspects. So Microsoft has uh, a partnership program and there's various levels of that partnership program. Um, so if you have enough developers in your organization that have certifications, you can qualify for some of those partner benefits. For example, uh, some of the benefits are, um, you know, free enterprise level Visual Studio subscriptions and stuff like that, right? But then also working with the partnership program to help maybe approach clients, you know, collectively, you know, with Microsoft um, and and your organization, right? So it's it's a way to kind of separate your organization from um, the competition. But uh, in in terms of just straight up sharpening your skills, I mean, there's countless ways to do that. Microsoft certifications are great. Uh, there's also things like Pluralsight, um, Egg. Egghead IO and things like that, right? Um, where you can you can kind of do things more at your own pace and uh, not have necessarily the formal assessments, but um, a way just to to stay sharp and make sure that you're learning. Uh, I also see there's 
there's options like the Google Developer Certificate, there's also associate and android developer certificate so there's a lot of options even from google as well as microsoft the microsoft one is more popular uh, especially in mauritius a lot of a lot of people do those certificate even i have planned to do one so this is this is something great and i agree that it will improve your company's reputation in terms of getting partnership with Microsoft or even, for example, Google. So this is great as well. So you shared some great points, Dave, and I would like to thank you for being on the podcast. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for, for having a podcast. Thank you for going above and beyond and asking um, you know community contributors to come forth and have conversations with you. This is one of the things that I'm a huge proponent of. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. And uh, hopefully we can do it again. Great. I would love to do another podcast with you in the future again. Maybe we could go on some other technologies. You, of course, mentioned that you are also familiar with Blazor and, and many other technologies. Maybe we can do another podcast in the future. So that was a great podcast. And... If you have any links to share or rather where people can find you, you can tell that also. I will include it in the podcast. Sure. Yeah, you can follow my blog at uh, David Pine, D-A-V-I-D-P-I-N-E dot net, um, where I blog quite frequently. And there's more than just a blog on there. There's It's a full-blown website. Um, and then you can follow me on Twitter at David Pine the number seven. So David Pine seven. Uh, yeah, pretty much where I'm at.